gentlemen, for your patience. We're going to get started. Religion plays a fundamental role in human society. It defines our cultural norms and values. It influences how our social groups are organized. And in these ways, it really shapes the political and economic trajectory of our societies. Despite this, we actually have little understanding of what leads people to be religiously adherent. And in part, that's because religious adherence is really difficult to measure. After all, if you want to understand how religious someone is, what can you do? And you could ask them. So let's look at some survey results that my co-authors Joshua Blumenstock and Michael Callan ran in Afghanistan, which is the country that I'm going to be talking about a lot today. In this survey, they asked people about the importance of different religious practices. So when asked about the importance of engaging in prayer five times a day, 93% of the respondents said this was a practice that was very important to them. When asked about the importance of giving zakat, the form of Islamic charity, 89% of the respondents said this was very important to them. When asked about the importance of fasting during Ramadan, 93% of the respondents said it was very important to them. So it turns out, if you ask people if they're religious, they say, yes, indeed, they're very religious. And this is just one of the challenges of surveys. People aren't always entirely honest in their response. But there's other challenges with surveys. You can't really run surveys in conflict zones. They're fairly expensive to field, so they tend to be fielded infrequently and typically are only representative at broad geographies like provinces. But what if I told you it was possible to get super granular and to see how religious a particular village is and how that religiosity changes from month to month or week to week? And what if I further told you that this was going to be a measure that was rooted in what people do rather than what they say? How would we develop such a measure? Well, here was our starting point. A core tenet of Islam is to engage in prayer five times a day. And this prayer is supposed to happen during specific windows of time. So how can we gauge if individuals are not actually adhering to the prayer norm during the prayer window? Well, we can measure the extent to which they're engaged in other activities. What's a common other activity that we might be able to measure? Talking on the phone is one such measure. And in fact, that's why mosques around the world display signs like this one. But this poster is so great, I have to read it to you. It says, when you enter this masjid, it may be possible that you hear the call of God. However, it is unlikely that he will call you on your mobile. Thank you for turning your phones off. If you want to talk to God, enter, choose a quiet place and talk to him. If you want to see him, send him a text while driving. <laughs> I think those are words that we can all live by. What it's, where does this lead us? Well, it leads us to the point that, you know, you can either pray or you can talk on the phone. You can't do both at the same time because, pray, because talking to others, whether it's in person or on the phone, is considered to invalidate prayer. So how are we going to leverage this? Well, what this means is if you're praying more, you're making fewer phone calls. So we are going to be measuring the change in call volume that occurs at the start of a prayer window to gauge the degree to which people are actually adhering, are not adhering to the religious norm. Now, we are going to be focused specifically on the Maghrib prayer window, the sunset prayer, uh, which has the advantage that it's a short window so we can gauge easier changes in call volume over a tight window. And secondly, the Maghrib prayer, as the name suggests, its timing is tied to sunset. That means the start time changes over the course of the year. This has the advantage that it's going to allow us to separate this effect out from, say, a 5 p.m. effect. So let me tell you about the data that makes this measurement possible. We have 10 terabytes of anonymized digital trace data from one of the largest cell phone providers in Afghanistan. And we have this data 
from 2013 all the way up until 2020, so right before the nationwide takeover by the Taliban. To give you a sense of the scope of the data, there are eight to nine million unique users per year in this data. Benchmark that against the population of Afghanistan, which is about 36 million. And these users are making 22 billion calls. When a call is made, we have the exact date and timestamp of when it's made and the location from where it's made that allows us to pinpoint exactly where the, and when these calls are taking place. Have you ever tried to visualize 22 billion calls? Let's give it a shot. So the first way I'm going to show you this is I'm going to take all eight years of data and I'm going to average it and I'm going to show you what the average call volume is in every minute of the day relative to Maghrib. Now when Maghrib is happening, it is changing in different times every day, but at the top of this figure, I show you an axis that's an illustrative day when Maghrib occurs at 6 p.m. So here's what happens to call volume. In the wee hours of the night, call volume is pretty low because most people are asleep. After that, it starts to increase. It reaches a peak around 9 or 10 a.m. That's like the rush hour effect. After that, it comes back down. It has a kind of local minimum at noon, which coincides with both the noon prayer as well as lunch. And after that, the call volume starts to go back up as we head towards sunset and the start of Maghrib. Now, here's the start of the Maghrib prayer window. And you can see right after that, there's a sharp dip in call volume, and that's what we call the Maghrib dip, and that's going to form the core of our measure. Before talking about that, though, let's visualize this data in another way. Here we have a heat map of the call volume. So let me orient you toward this figure. In this figure, each day on the, each, uh, on the x-axis is each day of a two-year snippet. On the y-axis is every minute of every day. The darker the shading, the more the call volume. The lighter the shading, the less the call volume. So if you're looking for a Maghrib dip in this figure, you're looking for a thin white line that occurs around the time of sunset. So can you identify the Maghrib dip in this figure? What if I give you the hint that it's sunset occurs between 1,700 and 1,900 hours in Afghanistan? <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you've started to hone in on that thin white line that's undulating at the top of the figure, and I'm going to make it super easy for you and tell you exactly when sunset occurs. Okay, and you can see that that thin white line, the Maghrib dip, tracks sunset perfectly. So in times of the year when sunset occurs later, the Maghrib dip occurs later. In times of the year when sunset occurs earlier, the Maghrib dip occurs earlier. But this figure actually has other very interesting signatures of Islamic religious observance within it. For example, you can see the two light bands in the figure, right? The two months of very light shading. Those are the holy months of Ramadan. That's a time of prayer and reflection, so overall call volume is low. But you can also see that the Maghrib dip itself is particularly stark during those two months. In addition, in the center of the figure, you see a lighter band. That is the noon prayer that also coincides with lunch. And there's a kind of striated pattern to it where every few days it looks like that white line is elongated. Those are Fridays. Those are the holiest day of the week when there is an additional Juma prayer added on after the noon prayer, which means people are staying off the phone for a longer period of time. So there's a lot of interesting features of this figure but I'm going to be focusing specifically on the Maghrib dip, which essentially, for our purposes, is a percentage fall in call volume that happens with the start of the Maghrib prayer window. So now, with this measure, we can answer various questions about how different political and economic shocks affect religious adherence in the country. So the first question we're going to be able to answer is how does Taliban control shape religious adherence? We can take our Maghrib dip measure and we can create a map out of it at the district level. Here, the darker the shade, the more religious the district. And one thing pops up right away. Many of the darkest districts, the ones that are most religiously adherent, had already been taken over by the Taliban in the 2013 to 2020 period. So, in fact, there were 11 districts that had been taken over by the Taliban during that time period, whereas 249 others had not. 
So we can do an event study figure like this to essentially measure if religious adherence increases in the district when it's taken over by the Taliban. And this figure shows definitive evidence that it does. In fact, about three months after the takeover, you see religious adherence rising in the districts that are taken over. And that's a lasting effect. As you can see, the overall post-takeover effect is statistically significant. This is consistent with the idea that the Taliban strictly and at times violently enforced religious norms. But this pattern also shows us how a measure like this can give us insight into what is happening to religious behavior in times and places that we normally just wouldn't be able to see this, right? After all, the Taliban would not have taken too kindly to surveyors showing up and asking questions about religion in these places. Okay, so the second question we want to answer is how does economic adversity shape religious adherence? And to look at that, we're going to look at economic adversity that stems from climate shocks or droughts that took place because, unfortunately, rising temperatures owing to climate change have increased the fre frequency and severity of droughts in Afghanistan to an all-time high. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our Maghrib dip measure and we're going to see when droughts occur, what happens to religious adherence at a monthly level in small grid cells that are about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers in size. And here's what we see. When droughts occur, we see an increase in religious adherence. How large is this effect? Well, we can consider the impact of a severe drought that took place in Afghanistan in 2018. And we see that drought increased religious adherence by 26% as much as Taliban takeover of a district affected religious adherence. So we can think of that as a 26% effect. What makes us think this increase in adherence has anything to do with the economic impact of drought? Well, we see quite different effects depending on whether the area was dependent on crop agriculture, and in particular, whether it was dependent on rain-fed croplands, which are the ones that are most vulnerable to a lack of rainfall. So in places that don't have a lot of rain-fed croplands, say the 10th percentile of the distribution, we see a pretty small effect of a 4% increase in adherence. But in places that are heavily dependent on rain-fed cropland at, say, the 90th percentile of the distribution, we see a large 92% effect in religious adherence. To further explore the role of economic adversity in this account, what we can also ask is, what happens when a drought strikes during the growing season for wheat, which is Afghanistan's most important crop? What happens to religious adherence in the remainder of the year? So here's the crop cycle for wheat. And what we see is when a drought strikes during the growing season, right away there's an increase in religious adherence. Now this is consistent with people praying for divine intervention, praying for rain. But that's not the only place where we see this effect. We also see an equivalent sized increase in religious adherence in the period after the harvest. Now, at this point, it's too late to pray for rain. The drought has already occurred. The harvest has already occurred. Farmers have already experienced an income loss from a bad harvest. So the increase in adherence here is consistent with people praying to cope with the income loss that they've experienced. Now, in contrast to this, we see no effect on adherence during the harvest season itself. But arguably, it's during harvest when differences in rainfall have created the greatest differences in how much work there is to be done. So the lack of an effect here suggests that this has nothing to do with the opportunity cost of working or what you have to give up in order to work. Rather, these results are consistent with the idea of people turning to religion in order to cope with economic adversity. So with that, Let's step back and look forward. What have we seen here today? I think what we've seen is that cell phone use contains signatures of important religious observance. And so far, we've prototyped this in an Islamic context, but we're already exploring applications to other religions. For example, Shabbat observance 
in Orthodox Juda Judaism means that you aren't meant to be using your cell phone. So we could imagine very much extending this to the context of Judaism. More generally, we think the digital trace data, whether it's cell phone use or it's internet use, are providing a window into religious behavior in times and places that we just typically would not be able to observe these dynamics. Now today, I've talked to you about what are determinants of religious observance, but you could just as well turn that question around and ask, what are the consequences of religious adherence? For example, do we see religious intensification in the run-up to conflict? And with real-time data on that, it may be even possible sources in order to improve our ability to predict conflict as it's occurring. In that way, the potential for this measure is as vast as the underlying data itself. Thank you.